Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 120 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with Matt Millage, formerly of the U.S. National Arboretum and now public space manager for the Georgetown Bid in Washington, D.C., all about Japanese maples. The plant profile is on Dianthus, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events. We had a little bit of sound trouble with Matt's interview, but I hope you'll bear with us. He shares lots of great information, and it's well worth the listen. This episode, we're joined by Matt Millage. He was formerly a horticulturist at the U.S. National Arboretum, and he was on the podcast talking all about camellias for our episode 85. And he's back with us today talking all about Japanese maples and his new position as public space manager with the Georgetown bid in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Matt. Hey, Kathy. So great to talk with you again. Good to have you back on the podcast and talking about one of your plant passions, Matt. And and I know Japanese maples are near and dear to your heart. And before we jump into that, since we talked about your background and a little bit about your childhood and other plants you love on the previous podcast interview with you. I think we'll just jump right into your new position and what that involves and what's a public space manager do. Yeah, it's a great question, Kathy, and thanks so much. Yeah, you're definitely right. Japanese maples are one of my favorites. I'm excited to talk about them today. And yeah, excited for my new opportunity actually in Georgetown, working with the Georgetown bid. It was a very hard decision to make to leave the National Arboretum because as any plant nerd knows, there are very few places like it, not just in this area, but in our entire country to have such a diverse amount of taxa on the same ground and really be able to dive into just so many realms of of you know plant diversity all in a either walk or especially in a career there so uh, i was really i lured into the public space manager world because you know i i really have developed a passion over the years for managing public spaces both plants and beyond for visitor experience and education and you know kind of tying things back into the history of the area as well and Georgetown Bid has a really unique opportunity to do all of those things in that space of Georgetown that is a unique park area, having the Riverfront Park and CNO Canal sharing that with the National Park Service and, you know, one of the area's elite retail and dining scenes, that bringing just a, a really huge amount of foot traffic to the area on a daily and annual basis. And also really, you know, the opportunity that, you know, a lot of people at the bid are already taken advantage of with the new CNO boat canal tours, bringing some of the history back to the area. And so all of that really was just a really enticing lure to move into this new role as public space manager, which really I kind of operate in the operations realm of the organization. So it is a unique opportunity for me to kind of help lend my expertise as a ISA certified arborist and former horticulturist to the green spaces, which are have we have a really talented landscape architect that's already been kind of carving out little portions of the neighborhoods that were maybe underused and really prime opportunities to be able to draw people to. And uh, she's already done a really great job with establishing a lot of those. And, you know, now it's just kind of doing some of the fine tuning and, and figuring out what plant choices maybe go for the long term. And that's a small portion of the job and also working with the contractors like Rupert that takes care of the iconic flower basket program along Wisconsin Street Avenue and M streets. Uh, you know, working with the clean team, we're really fortunate to have a really strong contracting partner and block by block, which keeps the neighborhood clean on a daily basis. You'll often see the guys, you know, in blue shirts, uh, answering people's questions and keeping the neighborhood as clean as, you know, possible for a neighborhood that gets visited by 14 million people a year. 
Uh, and then, you know, looking for new opportunities to talk to stakeholders, you know, all of the businesses in, the, in a bid, the business improvement district, um, pay a tax. That is what funds what the bid does. And, you know, so a lot of that goes to marketing and really, you know, creating opportunities uh, at different levels of the organization that I operate at to bringing people and, you know, getting them to stay in Georgetown and, and appreciate it as a lot of people here in D.C. already do. So really excited. Just my third week there um, and just kind of leaning into it as hard as possible and hitting the ground running. So excited to talk about it a little bit before we, we talk about Japanese maples. Yeah, sounds like a great opportunity. And with the magazine, we're very familiar with the Golden Streets Business Improvement District, which is more of the downtown Washington, D.C. area and their um, contest every year for street side gardens. Yeah. And I know Georgetown does such a fabulous job with those planters that you had mentioned from Rupert Landscapes. I'm, I'm really excited to see what next steps you take. Yeah, you know, us too, there's a lot of opportunities, but just recently, you know, they were able to add some more planters with the streetery program that came about during COVID, which has been just immensely successful in Georgetown that so much so that they're, they're pretty sure that they're going to extend it for another 18 months and maybe further. And so, yeah, you know, there's just lots of opportunities in a really neat historic neighborhood like that to, to green up the space more and create areas that, you know, create memories. So really exciting. And such a beautiful neighborhood, too, just for walking yeah, absolutely. around. Absolutely. Yep. Window shopping and just walking around and visiting some of the iconic gardens there, like, of course, Dumbarton Oaks and Tudor Place exactly. um, has to be part of any tourist schedule. <laughs> so, Couldn't agree more. Mm-hmm. Fortunate to be really close to those places for, you know, lunch break inspiration. <laughs> mm-hmm. So turning to our topic of the hour, uh, Japanese maples, let's first talk about maybe how they evolved and how the cultivars were bred and what people are looking for now in the modern Japanese maple. Yeah, that's a great question, because that's actually one of my favorite parts about Japanese maples is the history. And, you know, they really have such a long reaching history back into both the Japanese cultures and and Buddhism in China as well, you know, because so much of what Japan did in its early periods in the, you know, seventh and sixth centuries was really closely related to what Tang dynasty in China was doing. And and shortly after that as well, especially into the Haiyan period, which is where you really start to see a lot of both literature and paintings, art, come out of what a lot of people refer to as the golden era of Japan uh, being the Haiyan period, which was around 794 AD to, you know, roughly the mid 1100s. Mm -hmm. And that is when the capital of Japan actually moved. The the period changed from the Nara period to the Haiyan period. And the capital moved to Kyoto, which it stayed there for a thousand years. And, And the the a lot of people and historians that I've spoken to contribute a lot of that long term success to these first couple hundred of years of establishing just a, a really robust arts and culture there that had start to become unique away from the Chinese culture that they had so closely mirrored for hundreds of years due to both Buddhism being adopted and also just uh, the culture flow out of mainland China at that time into Japan was just really robust. So it really is an interesting thing as it starts to become its own culture in Japan and Kyoto in that high end period. Uh, you know, if you're thinking maybe early ninth century, late eighth century. So China is going through its own unique problems and the culture flow kind of stops for several hundred years Hmm. and Japan is able to start to really create its own culture and really start to find some of its own unique, both nature uh, as Buddhism is such so focused on nature as, as part of the spiritual experience and tying it into the culture as well. So, so you start to see, like I said previously, a lot of literature and art coming out that is uniquely written in Japanese. And what's also a neat, Part of that is that a lot of women start to produce art and literature during that period. And uh, many things that I've read 
contribute that to the fact that they spoke mostly Japanese, their, their homeland language. And a lot of the society elite men had spoken Chinese and thought that it was really important to produce art and things in, in Chinese language. So you start to see both sides of genders become involved in the arts in this golden period. And, and much of that art and literature, I promise I'm tying this into Japanese maples, is to or is, is focused on Japanese maples, which in that in the language is momiji, which uh, is uh, translated complete or to baby's hand from Japanese to English. And, and Acer Palmatum uh, was named Palmatum by Carl Thunberg, uh, a disciple of Linnaeus, Palmatum being the shape of a hand. So it, it ties into arts and culture that can be traced all the way back to some of the writings in the 800s. Um, and, and there's a huge following of, I would say, mostly maples and nature. So every autumn, Japanese folks from all levels of the hierarchy would make kind of uh, pilgrimages to the mountains and to see maple trees in their full glory. And this was known as Momiji Gari, Momiji being maple and tree being gari. So, it, it, and you see references to this going back as far as I think, I, I believe, late 790s. And then the tale of Genji was written in that late 8th century period. And it has multiple references to both Momiji gari, maple hunting. And also the cultivation of maples on proper on pe people planting them on their own properties, basically talking about the not necessarily uh, hybridization, but just the planting of and, and them having been a, a prominent part of their temple plantings. Um, and then there are prints that go all the way through the the late Edo period, which is closer to like the eight seventeen hundreds, eighteen hundreds. So eight eight excuse me. 18th century, 19th century Japan, um, just before they start to go through a, the a civil war period, uh, a lot of art was made. And uh, Yukiya O is a print by Udagawa Kunisada, a very famous um, and it covered in maple trees in their fall color. So you can just see almost a thousand years of culture and arts and literature built around the maple tree and, and uh, the maple leaf colors of the fall. And it really is prominent in, in so much of their literature and art for that period. And then going through, you know, by the late 1700s, there were 200 known cultivars of Japanese maples. And what's really interesting about that is, you know, they, around the early 1700s in garden catalogs, you can find about 30, you know, some maybe between 20 and 30. And then just 40 years later, the number is all the way up in the hundreds. And then by the end of the century, it's at 200. So you can just see that there was a, such a desire for the plant material all throughout Japan, that nurseries were, you know, really coming up with hybrids quite quickly. And all, Acer palmatum and Acer japonicum, both really being synonymous for Japanese maple. And if you're really to talk to Acer experts, you know, there are 23 spe species that uh, occur naturally on the Japanese islands. In Japan, I think one of the easiest ways to talk to Americans about how big a place is, is to relate it kind of to a state. And hmm. So Japan is the same size as Montana, base, spatially. And to have 23 species of, of maples occur naturally in that archipelago of islands is, is really pretty amazing. Uh, but typically when we're talking about the ornamental, we are talking about Acer palmatum and Acer japonicum. And the majority of those early cultivars tended towards Acer palmatum. Now we get into the, the 1800s and, and now we're looking at international trade of J Japanese maples. 1820 was when the first Japanese maple was introduced to England. Uh, a bit later here in America, the first one planted at Arnold Arboretum was March 1st of 1880. But, you know, in the 1800s, they're seeing their way around the world. And Yokohama Nursery Company is a really famous nursery company that 
comes out of uh, the Yokohama area of Japan, and and they had offices in both London and New York in 1893 and into the early 1900s, which just goes to show that this plant was 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 highly desirable and hmm. was so really widely used. It was able, you know, you're able to plant it through hardiness zones five through eight. So it really was starting to find its way all over into both formal and and you know less formal gardener less formal gardens as well where people were just wanting to grow it you know at home as well so it is just so so very well trafficked that it was all over the world and then world war ii comes along in the great depression and and japan itself several of those known 200 cultivars are actually now lost today because so much of all of the tree life there in Japan was cut down for firewood Ugh. and to make room to grow food for yeah. the citizenry of, you know, was at the time a, a, a very embroiled nation in World War II. So, uh, you know, people that had dedicated generations of their family to growing Japanese maples were both told by the government and out of necessity cut down trees that had been in their families for hundreds of years, possibly. Acers are a fairly short-lived species, I will say, in the wild. So so some of those trees could have been well over 100 years old, but, you know, around for a long time, and they were cut down, and very little thought was given to propagation at that time, again, because, you know, they're in the middle of a world war, and people need to eat and heat themselves and create energy. And so it kind of a dark period there. And, and much of that is kind of lost to the world, to be perfectly honest at this point. Um, however, there's a really bright side to it. Come 1960, there's just a huge renewed interest in Japanese maples, both palmatum and japonicum. Uh, and, and now actually shurisawainum and capillipes as well, both have all, have all four found their way into the trade very predominantly. But um and it just kind of skyrockets from the 1960s. People had missed the plant material so much, and it had been so many, a part of so many cultures there for a long time and garden traditions that, you know, with both technology and desire and the global marketplace that has just completely boomed from the 1960s on, we now find ourselves in a, in a really great place with Japanese maples again. And, you know, over a thousand cultivars, maybe probably well above that, to be honest, these days, maybe 12, 1300 and it is it's abundant you can find so many types now that they've been broken into several categories for leaf shape and size mostly but also for bark color and variegation uh and now the gardener has just a, a plentiful amount to pick from to find almost the right japanese maple for for so many garden situations hmm. such an interesting history thank you for that matt and I actually have a certificate in East Asian studies and I read the tales of, of Genji in Japanese class and, wow. <laughs> and I'm now having all those memories flooding back as you're talking about it. Cause I, you know, wasn't even thinking about the plant side of things then and the Japanese maples and, you know, how she describes the falling leaves and, you know, it's a very poetic novel. Yeah, um, as most of their literature, from mm -hmm. what I understand at that time is, is very poetry based. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting to hear that you've read that previous to your horticultural kind of knowledge building. That's that's so interesting. Yeah. And so, it's a, a, you know, almost lyrical descriptions that she has of the plants, but also um, when you were talking about them going in, in pursuit in the mountains and looking for unusual and beautiful fall coloring in the Japanese maples that's obviously parallel to the northeast here for the leaf peeping season and people following the color up the coast into New England. Um, so definitely some parallels there. Yeah, I see those as well. And and you know what's what's neat is you're right in that temperate area both here in North America and in Japan and China as well. Um, it is very much part of the cultures to get out into the mountains and, you know, follow it up the elevation as the species change, uh, seeing those different colors. And it's, I think some of the great tie-ins to why we've had so much success in our plant. Well, I said our, the USNA, the National Arboretum had so much success in their plant collection efforts in, in both, you know, China, Japan, Korea, you know, so many commonalities 
and hmm. both, you know, weather patterns and terrain. And that does bring up, as we're talking about coloration and terrain, so Japanese maple want to be, I think, on a hillside, correct, with good drainage or some type of yeah, elevation. Definitely correct. And also, you know, they're typically an understory tree mm-hmm. in the wild, so they don't mind part shade. And in fact, they really prefer it, especially when you get into some of the cultivars now that have, you know, deep coloration or variegation on the leaves, you know, the, the hottest parts of the day, they're going to really appreciate some, some shading. Um, mm-hmm. with, with, with full sun, okay, then the, in the cooler mornings or evenings. Mm-hmm. So basically morning sun, afternoon shade, if possible, and yeah. some type of either plant them high, you would say, in the planting yes, hole? good drainage, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and that's what we, you know, I do believe that, you know, the common terminology is planted proud, planted high, you know, and that's the truth if you look at how, how both the ISA or any local tree planting organizations are, are teaching responsible planting. It's, you know, if anything, build a little platform mound in the center of your, your tree hole that's three times as wide as the root ball. And just to make sure that that root flare is sitting above the grade of the ground. Mm-hmm. It's just because girdling roots can definitely hurt the tree for any species, but for Japanese maples, the extra drainage there is going to be, is going to be really important. Mm-hmm. It's one of the few things that actually can do a, a Japanese maple in is sitting in a boggy situation. They are such resilient trees, so little. We'll talk more about that later, I'm sure. Pest and disease, mm-hmm. pressure. It's really just planting it where it's going to stay wet is about your, your, your one guarantee for killing one pretty quick. Mm. And so maybe a dry shade spot yep. with morning sun sounds, sounds like ideal, but obviously you want to water it in uh if there's any drought periods or in its first couple years of getting established. Yeah. Absolutely. First three years are your most important for establishment and gator bags can go a long way. You know, watering bags can Mm -hmm. go a long way for making sure that those waterings are slow and deep and, and, you know, once a week, the rule is about an inch of water uh, a week. And, you know, that of course can be supplemented with the rain that you get in the forecast. But, but then after that, after that three-year establishment, you, you got it absolutely right, Kathy, just in periods of drought, will you want to supplement those trees? And you'll see when they start to flag a bit or they start to get some seared edges, you know, Hey, it hasn't rained in a couple of weeks. I, I should probably set a hose on that really low and slow hmm. for, for a few hours. Um, And yeah, the the hillside siding, you know, I was really fortunate in my time at the National Arboretum to do a lot of hillside gardening in the Asian collection. There are some steep hills. And what we saw is those, you know, those maples sited with a a fair amount of, you know, not exceedingly amount of grade, but a decent amount of slope to where water's draining away easily, but, but they're still able to get some percolation. You know, there's still a flat enough grade for, for some slow percolation and rain that those, those did better over the long haul. And that, you know, those towards the bottom of the hill that maybe got just a, a bit too much runoff and started to get a little flat and they started to sit maybe as wet feet a little too long. Those those are the ones that we were, you know, cutting out in my years there. Hmm. And what about in planting in the root zone? I think that I'd heard that Japanese maples are fairly shallowly rooted and don't like any root competition. That's true of all maples being shallow rooted, to be honest, surface rooted, very, very few there. And, and, you know, lots of understory trees have that kind of uh, more of a top layered root system. And the more research that gets done into tree root systems, the more that we're finding even large, you know, what we used to think were deep tap rooted trees uh, have just much wider fibrous root systems that tend more to the three to five inches below the soil. And that's really, you know, how they're really able to compete with all of the things around them growing in a, you know, a balanced eco forest ecosystem. Um, but yes, Japanese maples specifically just really don't like root disturbance after is what I've found after. So if you're, you know, you're, you're going to do some research and do some understory plantings, you know, do a, you know, do a, a full complementary planting let's say maybe a carex of some sort underneath or, or even s- some sort of sh- short shrubs. Um, I would just be careful that I'm putting them right where I want them. And I'm giving not too, too full of a dispersion of other plants in that immediate canopy zone of the Japanese maple. Um, and, and just, just letting them be <laughs> that time after, unless you really have to remove them 
because uh, you think they're taking too much away from the maple. But, uh, you know, a, a smart planting plan can be done that, that has some some plantings that are more uh, ground cover. Hmm. Yeah, and I would think planting at the same time or yeah. right yep. after and not Yeah, very close. Back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. It's so before those Japanese maple roots are really spreading out in all directions by a few feet. I would say get it in before that. And then you'll, it, it, I'd just say that's more of a recipe for success. Not to say that you couldn't do it the other way and, and, and be very careful and water it a lot after and for establishment. And cause root pruning is a real thing as well. So, you know, it can be done. And earlier you had said seared edge to the leaves and when they get a little crispy from a drought and I've seen two other reasons for what I call burnt edges to the leaves and one is a late frost and mm-hmm. the other is what we had already alluded to which is the situation of being in hot afternoon sun like too much direct sun on the leaves that can scorch them as well um, exactly let's talk a little bit about the late frost or when the japanese maples leaf out how tender those leaves are yeah and in this area it's, it's just you know spring is so tricky sometimes as far as when we're going to get that last frost and sometimes we've well i will just say in the last several years we've had some very warm stretches of march and even february that have pushed in my time at smithsonian gardens one just terrible example for as far as the ornamental side is we had the Sulangiana magnolias get fooled into blooming about you know starting to at least lose their protective tepals uh about i guess a week before we ended up having a frost and every single flower on every single tree just got toasted Mm. and that's another example of of frost kind of biting so maples will flower first with small inconspicuous flowers and it's typically very early much before all the other trees except for elms have flowered and uh so they're leafing out in that that kind of precarious time between march and april and so, like Kathy's mentioning, as the leaves start to emerge, those those edges are really exposed first and kind of take that frost burn. Uh, and then it, it, they'll unfortunately hold it for the whole year, typically, if it's a frost situation. And, and you know, if they're starting to get scorched in the sun, there's, there's also – you got to catch it pretty quick if you want to save it. But it's also one of those things where it's kind of just a – it's really just a, a – a, a, a note that you've probably put that maple in the wrong place. <laughs> that's probably getting a little too much sun in the afternoons. This might happen every single year. Mm-hmm. And that's not the ornamental look anybody wants when they plant a Japanese maple to have scorched leaves for half the, half of the summer. So, there's a few cultivars we'll talk about later that take full sun much better than others. And mm-hmm. typically being, you know, some of the, the brighter green leaves bordering on chartreuse and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say that I can imagine there might be some situations where you had full afternoon shade yeah. and then that tree above it, that somehow the canopy died back or something happened or it lost a limb or the whole tree. And then it's all of a sudden exposed to full sun. So then you have to make that decision of, do you move the Japanese maple or you wait for that over story to fill in again? Yeah, you're right. And and I should say also, you know, some of the... The red and purple leaves are, are – Japanese maples are just absolutely perfect for full sun. You know, it's really some of the variegation and uh, – really variegated are the most sensitive by far. And, and, and then some of the other uh, smaller and uh, more full moon style are, are sometimes more suited for the shady afternoon – situations and then also I, I should say that it is really convenient that there was a really smart guy named jd vertrees who wrote actually what i would consider the bible of japanese maples called japanese maples um i think it's the second or third edition by now but uh he's out of oregon he was an entomologist and researcher and he did a lot of the hard work to kind of break these Japanese maples down into groups to make it easier to kind of know what is going to work well in full sun or what is going to be the habit of this tree over 20 years plus height wise and spread wise. Uh, what are the fall colors going to be? And and then uh, there's a, the Maple Society of the UK has taken that even a step further 
and broken it into several more categories. Uh, JT Vertrees originally was seven, and now there's 17. But they're all extremely helpful if you know the situation you want and the look that you're going for, what's your full sun, what's your shade situation. And, and it really starts to help break down those thousand plus cultivars into more digestible chunks of information and, and, and plant groups. Hmm. And so if you have some burnt leaves or burnt edged and or that they um, came in and got frosted, do you recommend leaving those leaves or plucking some off that it might re-leaf out or just um, trim some of that? You know, I would say that it really varies on the how badly it happened. You know, I would definitely take off anything that's more than 50% burnt just aesthetically and if, if you have the time to you know depending on how big the tree is of course and how tall it gets um uh and then if you had and then you know the maples have the possibility to kick out a few more leaves from from uh from some some resting buds that would be in that area that may be triggered through you know a bit of pruning um and leaf removal. And then if you had, you know, I would say small branchlets that were completely, you know, like all of the leaves look bad. And yeah, I wouldn't say there's anything wrong with pruning there early in the season and the maple will, will continue to grow and, and it may even, you know, send some reactive growth in that same area with fresh leaf, you know, mm -hmm. that will, will get you through the season looking a little crisper. Hmm. But not, that's not the right word. When we're talking about crispy. Yeah. Just a little cleaner, <laughs> a little, cleaner, <laughs> a little fresher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so with climate change on a lot of people's minds these days and hotter and more humid summers here, you would mention that Japanese maples, uh, growing zone five to eight. So they really don't like, uh, summer heat, I think for keeping their color. I've heard of a process called going green. Or yeah. I think that's the, what is referred to when the coloring, um, that nice purple or whatever variegation you have just kind of goes to a straight maple green. Yeah. And definitely really stressful heat summers will do that or stressful early, you know, late springs, early summers when they're really kind of developing that color. Yeah. We'll, we'll, will create some of those cytokinins to, to not really develop as well. And that is what causes those colorations to happen. Um, and, you know, I will say that I, I've only seen that really start to get bad, you know, Carolinas and South in my garden tours. I I've, I haven't seen it really affect unless, you know, a tree is put in a really hot, stressful situation. Um, if it's sited correctly in this area, I know we are a 7B and I know with the last few winters working towards an 8A, as you know, I don't think we've had a temperature below 15 degrees in the last three winters. Um, so it is definitely when you hear five to eight, you hear this area, you're like, man, am I, am I putting a plant in a stressful area? But, you know, I think another thing that, that is to be said about Japanese maples is their adaptability. You know, I've saw them, I've seen them planted in Southern California and doing great in a shady area, kind of an understory planting where, you know, that's typically a nine when you think, or maybe even a 10, depending on what part of Southern California you're in. But, um, but this was closer to like the coast of San Diego and planted in a really interesting kind of Japanese style garden. And, and they were doing fine. They definitely had been there for several years from the size. So, hmm. you know, I've seen them planted in, in, in Georgia as well and in, in Southern Georgia, which, you know, is probably an eight pushing a nine as well and doing great. So I think it's about location mostly, you know, really correcting, excuse me, picking the correct site. And I wouldn't push it in, you know, Southern Florida or anything like that, but anywhere where, you know, the rest of your deciduous trees are, are dropping their leaves in the fall still. And it's not a completely subtropical area in, in here in, in America that I think they, they can work, you know, and I would be, I would be hesitant to put them anything below a four, you know, just because of winter hardiness. But as far as heat goes, I think you can push it a little which is nice with this plant. So I don't, I wouldn't have any hesitations in this area as long as you're really siding them well. Good to know, especially with, you know, that coming climate yeah, change. Yeah, it's, it's getting warmer. I, I, I completely agree. You know, this, this area is getting warmer. Our winters are absolutely tending to be warmer. And, you know, all you have to do is look at the minimum low. And we're trending more towards like a Raleigh, North Carolina, 8A. Yep. So 
uh, and really smart people that have been around a lot longer than me in the plant world are saying the same thing. So um, I, I tend to also think about that. Is this plant going to be able to to sustain our summers in the next 10 years plus when I'm putting especially a tree in my yard or in my garden? And that does bring us to the ideal planting conditions for Japanese maple. So is fall best for planting them or is spring better? I think fall always. I, you know, I'm, I, I put my ISA arborist hat on for this answer and the less stress that that plant can see, you know, in that first six months, the better. And the real stress for a newly planted tree is heat. I think, I think most gardeners would agree with most new plantings as a whole. Heat is your real enemy, not cold. A root ball can freeze really easily and have no damage, you know, to it the way that, you know, if you scorch the canopy or, or, it, or that root ball, heaven forbid, doesn't get enough water in that first summer, it's just a recipe for disaster long term. So I really suggest to anyone that asks me, when should I plant any tree, not just Japanese maples, but Japanese maples specifically uh, fall, you know, we're starting to get into the right time now, but I would still wait a couple of weeks until, you know, daytime highs are tending more in the mid seventies mm -hmm. and it is not stressing that root ball out as much. Um, I, I, I think that is, but that being said, you can absolutely plant a tree in the spring, but you're just going to have to baby it more. And then I would definitely rep recommend a watering bag for that first year, especially so that you're making sure you're filling it up with a hose at least once a week, maybe twice, depending on what kind of rain. Um, and, and really setting yourself up for success that way. Hmm. And so we planted the tree, it's gotten established. Um, are we going to fertilize it right away or what type of fertilizing schedule do you recommend, if any? You know, I, I would recommend a, a great top dressing of a good compost, maybe a good leaf mold compost, or, you know, even if you're going to buy something out of the bag, leaf grow is great. And then a nice two inch layer of mulch, it's going to help both trans, you know, both percolate some great nutrients and minerals into the ground every time it rains, um, but also help retain some moisture. And, and then that would be your next step. And then, you know, after the trees established, you know, I, I would say every, you know, every other year, if you're, if you're not happy with the growth that it's putting on a balanced 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, you know, well worked into the top of the soil. I'm not a big fan of tree spikes. Uh, you know, I don't know what other people's feelings are about those, but I just don't feel like they work their way into the correct amount of root system. As we were just talking about, a tree sets out a root system feet beyond its canopy. So if you can work in the correct poundage of a 10-10-10 into that top couple inches of soil, and then, you know, I would then redress it with a mulch. And that would be a great way to fertilize them for, for the duration of that tree being in the ground. Hmm, excellent. And then the question that always comes up around Japanese maples is proper pruning technique. Yeah, you know, I like to really think about some of the just the real basics for tree pruning and that you're looking to take out the three D's first, anything dead, diseased, or dying. And then after that, any branches that are rubbing each other that could cause a wound in the bark that could then be a real vector for disease. You know, those are your four real places to start. And then, you know, you're really going to want to think about both what the, what is the cultivar's habit because, you know, both Acer palmatums and japonicums both have just a huge range of, of variety that you're going to choose from. So if you're going for something that's a bit lower of a grower and that spreads further out, you know, like uh, Crimson Queen, Acer palmatum Crimson Queen is – is, 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 you know, maybe will be six feet tall and 12 feet wide. So following those first rules of pruning and then going in and knowing the plant habit and, and kind of helping to accentuate that. Taking crossing branches out is, is, a, is a good way to kind of help see some more structure inside the tree. Thinning back um, anything that could be, you know, something if it's an upright tree, a, a competing leader. Uh, it always helps to kind of continue push more growth out in the bottom of the tree and fill it in better. And if it's more of a weeping habit, then, you know, obviously it's going to be lots of competing leaders going in lots of different directions, but knowing, you know, where you want it off the ground, pruning to keep branches and of kind of in that, maybe that, that one to two inches off the ground to keep that neat kind of hovering look for the tree. 
So, you know, there's really a lot of options depending on the cultivar, but some of those basics, I think it's really important to stick to those. You know, you're dead, you're diseased, you're dying branches, anything that's rubbing and causing a wound, and then anything that is, you know, growing into a place that you don't want it. You know, you are, it's your kind of aesthetic that you're going for and feel free to have a, a bit of liberty with that. As long as you're not taking any, you know, bad pruning cuts, of course, for all of our good gardener listeners out there. <laughs> and that means pruning it at, you know, a slight angle right at the the crotch of the branch yep, exactly, and not yep. like letting those little stubs stick out all over. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hard to describe, but hopefully people can picture I that. think, you know, I think your listeners are pretty hip to that yes. too. But yeah, exactly. Taking it down to the next growth point. Great. And then you had mentioned that Japanese maples aren't too troubled by disease or pests, but maybe we should talk about what people could look for if there was something to happen. Absolutely. And, you know, some of the, some of the things that really are, are going to be necessary to look at is, like you said earlier, making sure that you have good drainage when you're planting. And then they, they want to stay evenly moist and it's good to have that good mulch layer. So if you're keeping them in that place, then I, I, I promise you're going to have very few disease problems. But um, th- one of the only things that really I've come across is there, a bit of phytophthora occasionally. And, and that is also going to be from a fungal disease that is going to be mostly from boggy conditions, you know, them sitting in too much water. So, I will say, you know, your green and yellow forms are going to be your most sun tolerant. You know, summer gold is one of the common cultivars I see in nursery centers. And, and, you know, if you've got a variegated plant and it's getting full sun and you're starting to see things on it that maybe you feel are disease or pest, then I would just stress to, to check how much sun the tree is getting during the day. Um, now, if you have a green or a more yellow leaf one and you're starting to see shot hole or more disease, then, then I, I would I would check fungal disease first. And that's really the only thing that you ever occasionally see on these. You know, they don't get pest disease, pest pressure of any sort, really. I mean, you might see some aphids hop on some from an adjoining plant that's infested, but, you know, you don't see a big infestation usually. It's usually just kind of a neighbor thing. They usually leave pretty quickly in my experience. Um, and yeah, fungal disease is really the, the, what you really need to look out for. And, and they're typically related to, to moisture and specifically too much. And so now we'll turn to the really fun part, which is talking about our favorite cultivars and maybe some sourcing um, for anybody who wants to add some more Japanese maples to their garden or collection. And I was just looking at blood good in a neighbor's yard because I know that is probably the most common one that you can probably pick up at, you know, any big box store. Absolutely. Yeah. And a very popular one for the, the, you know, the red to crimsonish almost color of leaf during the growing season. So, you know, they'll emerge kind of with that uh, yellowish red and go to a deeper red through the season and then kind of a, a, an orange for fall, excuse me, for fall. And, uh, but, you know, I think that there's some extra excellent convex lobe. You know, this is the convexum group, but a really cool red is called Trompenberg. It is, it's a fairly upright form, you know, it goes 15, 20 feet tall, and, you know, 10, 12 feet wide. Um, and convex lobes mean it has the really, really deep lobes, the deep sinuses actually that go between the lobes of the leaves. Um, very hardy. It's got a really neat crimson red in autumn and, and kind of more of a purplish red in summer. Uh, this is a cultivar. It was discovered as a seedling at the Trompenberg Arboretum in Rotterdam, a place that has a lot of history of, of tree hybridization. And, and it's also, you know, one of those, I think metals that can't be ignored is the RHS award of garden merit, which is the Royal Horticultural Society of England award of garden merit, which means it's been tried and, you know, one of the RHS or several of the RHS properties with great success. Hmm. And for more of say a golden or almost orange yeah. look. 
Yeah. So, you know, there's two neat ones that I like to recommend. Uh, there's there's an Acer Shira Sawanum, which is more of the full moon leaf. So, so less deep sinuses between the lobe and kind of more of a rounded appearance uh, with se- sometimes 10 or 12 lobes to the leaf. Um, Orium is one name it's sold under, but Golden Moon is what I see it under most. Um, and this is an amazing chartreuse yellow, orange, all spring, summer. And then it goes to uh, just vibrant red and orange for fall. Uh, it's fantastic. And then if one that I think is a little easier to find is Acer Palmatum Summer Gold. And it's like a golden yellow, orange all summer and, and kind of gets a little bit of a margin of orangey red along around the margin of the leaf. Um, and then fall time, it gets kind of a pink orange, which I think is unique for uh, for Acer, for Japanese maple as a whole. Very few Acers get that pinkish tinge in their fall color. And this one definitely goes pink before it goes to red. Um, so it's a really neat kind of week as it's changing into its deeper fall color. And then there's there's another one, Green Cascade, if you're looking for a weeping type of Japanese maple, which is, so this is going to be uh, six, seven foot, you know, maybe 10 after 30 years, but you know, 10 or 12 foot spread um, with a, a really, it's a graceful weeping habit, you know, that kind of just drapes like a waterfall. It's not super heavy, like a, a weeping beach where you don't necessarily get as much spread with the weeping branches and it's got a very delicate leaf nine to 11 almost lacy kind of appearance Hmm. and it is a beautiful green yellow Uh, you know maybe chartreuse excuse me chartreuse ish Hmm. in the summer and then a really beautiful orange red in the fall that sounds wonderful i love all kinds of weeping trees but that sounds particularly gorgeous and how about one with some interesting bark for even more full season or winter season uh, appeal in the garden? Yeah, you know, some people really, really, really love the red bark group, which uh, Sangu Kaku is the Japanese name for the probably most popular that you see in this area and most easy to attain. And, and I will say the most successful that I have ever grown in both a pot for winter and summer and in the ground. So this is a very, very adaptable tree and is used throughout uh, urban settings as a container plant. So this is like, you know, you got a patio out back and you're really looking for a four season plant and a planter that doesn't take a ton of space. And I think this is the Japanese maple for that person. It's going to have a beautiful red, almost bordering on salmon bark that gets more and more vivid with the cold winter or the cold weather. And then when it leaves out, it gives a beautiful bright yellow, a green beginning to its leaf, which goes to a more of a, more, more of a, I would say bright green for the summer. And then has a really neat bright yellow fall color. It goes back to that kind of yellowish green and then yellow in the fall. So it, as far as a tree, it is very much a four season interest and has some of the most beautiful red bark I've seen on any tree ever. And that's, you know, that is one that I think can fit both the container small garden and the large garden but is also just really uh, interesting conversation piece. Mm-hmm. People don't see red bark trees very often. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it makes Japanese maple, you know, it's one of those ideal for city garden, for small space or urban gardens, yes. but a- adaptable enough to have, you know, several, if you have the space for it. Yeah, exactly. With the dwarf varieties, you know, you can really get creative with some layering even of, of a Japanese maples in a space where if you, you know, you maybe you want two and you've only got maybe a depth of 20 feet or so. And, you know, you can put a small one up front that does, adds a lot of interest and character and something a little taller in the back towards maybe, maybe where your, your natural shade line of the property occurs and so, yeah, they just give so many options. Uh, there's another really fun one in the Coralinum group which is uh, the group that's going to have kind of the most variegation and interesting leaf pattern. And it's called Amber Ghost. And it's also, excuse me, also often used in a container as that kind of the thriller 
you know, it, it will be the tall four or five year old tree in a, a fair size container that really just adds a ton of both leaf texture and color interest. And that also does provide it with great drainage and controls the, yeah. the size of it. And of course, Japanese maples are also used in bonsai uh, applications as well. For centuries, centuries and centuries. In fact, you know, they're pinjing as well in the Chinese culture also, which is actually the predecessor to bonsai in Japan. They adopted that from just like we were talking about earlier with the Chinese culture kind of pouring from mainland China and Japan. They also adopted that there. And uh, it's one of those really beautiful parts of the National Arboretum. If people want to go see uh, Japanese maples and bonsai training or Penjing training, I think that is by far the best place in this area to be able to see the diversity of cultivar and also how training over decades and centuries in some cases really lend themselves to how a tree can can just be so unique Mm -hmm. yeah a great place to visit especially in the fall but year round yeah and so any cultivars or favorites that we've missed in our discussion so far matt yeah i've I've got a very uh, one that's near and dear to my heart it is it's a japanese cultivar a mikawa yatsubusa and it's a dwarf, about five feet tall, maybe three to five feet wide. And it's called, it's from the crispum group, which is the wavy or curly leaf group of Japanese maples. And it's a, it's a true dwarf. Everyone that you grow from, you know, seed or, or asexual propagation is going to come true to form. And it is just beautiful layering of branches and leaves that almost look shingled. Uh, it's got an incredible fiery red fall color and uh, kind of a light yellow green for the summer so it can take full sun pretty well. Uh, you know, and at its full habit, it, it can, it, from certain angles, it can almost look spherical, which is kind of neat. Uh, one of my real favorites, we grew it at the U.S. National Arboretum. Uh, it's kind of going down the stairs just uh, into the Japanese garden off of the parking lot. Uh, there on the left, and I've probably been there for almost 20 years now, and I think it's about four feet tall. <laughs> I really, I, I've always really had a place for true dwarf Japanese maples. I think the slow growing is just very interesting and, and something, you know, it just takes a long time to get what you're waiting for. I think there's something to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's such a, a way to experience the garden up close as well. Yeah. And really be, um, you know, in uh, union with that tree versus a tree that just takes off into the sky, you know, after a decade or so. But this is yeah. one that you're living with on a day to day basis. Completely agree with that. You know, at eye level or below, it's just it's something more intimate about it uh, mm-hmm. to me as well. Yeah, I agree. So thank you, Matt, for sharing your passion for Japanese maples. And how can our listeners get in touch with you if they want to find out more? Yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions or just to talk a little more about, you know, the the genus and species. Um, They can get in touch with me at my personal email. Now that I'm not with the National Arboretum, I'll I'll try to kind of keep these things compartmentalized a bit. Um, So Matt Millage, 46, that would be M-A-T-T-M-I-L-L-A-G-E, 46, at gmail.com. And I will be sure to get back to people right away. Thank you so much, Matt. It's been such a pleasure talking with you again, Kathy. And, you know, it feels like it was just yesterday we talked about camellias. So it's really nice to pick up where we left off. Dianthus plant profile. Dianthus species is a flowering plant family that includes the familiar florist carnations. Dianthus are mainly native to Europe and Asia. They are also known as sweet william or pinks. Dianthus can be annual or perennial. If perennial, they are generally hardy from zones three to nine. The plants range from ground hugging types to varieties that are two feet tall. The foliage and stems are a pretty blue-green and have a waxy feel to them. These long-lasting blooms make a terrific cup flower. 
The flowers come in hues from white to pink to red. Many have splotches of accent colors in the center or interesting variegated patterns. The zigzag or fringed edge of the flower petals is distinctive and sets them apart from most other blooms. They have a spicy sweet scent, usually described as clove-like. Dianthus prefers full to part sun and well-draining alkaline soils. They do well in container plantings and rock gardens. Remove the spent flowers to encourage reblooming and fertilize them a few times during the growing season. Divide perennial dianthus every few years in early spring. Dianthus, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, in my home garden, I'm enjoying seeing the seed heads on all the clematis vines. They're so fun to look at. They look like, you know, powder puffs, little spiders, but lend some nice fall texture. Over at the community garden, the seedlings are up for the seeds we planted last week of shard, kale, and radish. The broccoli seedlings are also doing well, and we planted this week lettuce and snap peas. We'll see if we beat the frost for those. We're still picking lots of cucamelons, cherry tomatoes, okra, and peppers as well, but I think the large heirloom tomato vines are pretty much done, so I've pulled those out. In the local gardening world, a few events I wanted to let you know about include the Weed Wrangle at Tudor Place Historic House and Garden. That's on Saturday, September 24th in the morning at 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. It's a helping of removal of invasive species from the Historic House Museum in the heart of Georgetown, Washington, D.C. Across the river on October 1st from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. The shops at Mount Vernon are having a plant sale. You do not need to pay for entry to Mount Vernon to attend the sale. They have cool weather, perennials, trees and shrubs, in addition to heirloom plants, many native plants, and plants that support our pollinators, insects, and birds. The exclusive General's Choice line features plants propagated from seeds or cuttings collected from plants growing on George Washington's estate. You can find more information about that at mountvernon.org. Another local event of interest coming up is the Ichabon International Chapter Number 1 in Washington, D.C. Luncheon and Demonstration. That's on October 27th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Columbia Country Club in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Um, that is a membership event, but open to non-members. Members pay $60, non-members pay $65. And you can find out more about that at iichapter1.com. Happy gardening! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. 
You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at washingtongardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.